everybody, I'm Hayley Victoria and welcome back to my crime and policing channel. In today's session, we are exploring the IPLDP program and specifically, we are going to go into detail about the knowledge check element. So just a quick overview. So I've already done like a little bit of a video on the IPLDP, but I've had lots of requests for further info. And I, I like to be the gift that keeps on giving and you guys um, enjoy this present. So we're looking at the IPL Dip, which is your initial police learning development program. This is a traditional entry route into the police. Now, a lot of people think, I don't know why or where they've got this from, that you just do 16 to 20 weeks or whatever in police training, then off you pop, out into the big wide world, you're a fully fledged police officer. It's not really like that. So you have got your 18 or so weeks in police training. Um, the timing does depend on whether there's like bank holidays in there or whatever. For example, if you're trading and it's a king's coronation, there's going to be extra days added on to make sure you get all your input. So you'll have this period in training initially, so your first set of training, but you're actually studying for two whole years. You're not a fully signed off cop for a whole two years, right? So it's not just you do this um, 16 to 20 weeks and off you pop jobs are good in, you've still got a lot of training and stuff to be done in the background. You're not on full wax salary, put it that way, until after you've been in for a couple of years. So it's not the quick fix that some people feel it might be. When you complete your Ripple Dip, you'll get a level three qualification in policing, obviously. Um, and it's a two year course, like I've said. So throughout this, you'll have role play scenario things that you've got to go through to prove your competence. So it might be that you're doing like a shoplifting or something, and all of these are assessed. You have to pass your role plays. You'll get a couple of attempts. So if you dip first time, you get a couple of attempts, but you have to pass these before you're able to go out to district. Because if you're not confident talking to people or arresting somebody in a safe environment, they're not going to send you out there to do it. Now, these role plays used to cause students so much anxiety when I was in training. Um, yeah, that I don't know why, guys, that you're in a safe space. But yeah, it's, it's a massive thing. You'll also have a number of knowledge checks planned throughout this. So where I was, I think there were three or four in total. You have them every few weeks throughout your training. And then at the end, you have a big one that encompasses everything you've learned so far. Um, yeah, and they're also quite nerve-wracking because you have to pass those. You know me rustling my books. You have to pass your knowledge checks before you're allowed out at district. Now, if you require um, special measures put in place for your training, such as yeah, a scribe or someone to read out questions for you, you can have that. So any um, reasonable adjustments can be made in training. It's proper inclusive, which is great. Um, you have to just let your trainers know. Okay, so like I said, we're looking at the IPLDIP program today. Not every force does this and looking online at um, the police databases and all these kind of things I've been looking at, the IPLDIPs are only open where they are open till March 24. So it's a kind of an interim measure as we are going through the national uplift process at the minute. And that means there's a massive, massive, massive deficit in police officers because this, around this time, 30 years ago, loads of cops were recruited. They've all retired now, so now we need to replace them with new ones, and that's why we are recruiting you guys. And um, if you're not actually wanting to be a police officer and you're watching this, not you, but for everyone else who is, this is why we've got such a big recruitment drive at the moment. But it's important we get the right people, right bums, right seats, and that you're in it for the right reasons. So the Apple Dip is not a quick fix. It's not a couple of weeks and then that's it, off you pop. It is a proper process, like I said, for at least two years. In your first week on the IPLDP, you will get your uniform. That's exciting. Your first day will be picture taken. You'll meet your new course mates and your trainers and you'll be suitably terrified. And you'll get your uniform. You'll have a discussion with the Police Federation. Your um, local professional standards department will come and talk to you. It's really important you listen to them and uh, yeah, tell you what not to do and how to behave like a proper police officer. Once you have joined the police, you have attested and, you know, you've done all this business. You are a police officer. Your behaviour needs to reflect that. I'm going to do a proper video on professional standards um, coming up because I think it's super important. So right now, without further ado, let's go into the knowledge checks. So I've created a number of questions based on the knowledge checks um, that happen in the IPLDP programme. And 
yeah as you will see when i go through this with you and the reason why i want to do this is because people get terrified of these but if you know how to read them they become a lot less scary and all we are looking for are points to prove generally um yeah so if you know your points to prove i recommend getting one of these bad boys they used to give them out um years and years ago but if you can find one of these kick him around your local um, training school or ask your um, trainers if they've got some because these have got all the different points to prove inside super useful even if you just get like a second hand one from a charity shop or something they are very very good okay so question one we are look i'm going to pop this up on my screen so you can read it through with me so newman is wanted by the police on suspicion of assault in which a knife was used he voluntarily goes to the police station good lad where you arrest him on suspicion of the assault as you have the appropriate necessity criteria okay do you have the power to search newman after arrest under section 32 of the police and criminal evidence act 1984. so the way these questions are broken down we have a scenario at the top of the story and then we have the main bit the body of the question is the bit in bold and then we have an, an it's like a multiple choice question thing at the bottom one of them is always completely wrong so you can count that one out and there's normally a couple that are a little bit meh could it be but we're looking at the finite details of the definition of whatever we're looking at the points to prove so let's have a look at the answers uh, no there's no suspicion that newman is in possession of evidence or a weapon yes Newman has been arrested for an assault where a weapon has been used. Yes. Provided you really suspect that Newman is in possession of evidence relating to an offence. Oh no, there is no power to search Newman under section 32 in these circumstances. Well, what this question is actually doing is testing your knowledge of section 32 of PACE. And we are looking at searching people, aren't we, after arrest. So, can we search somebody after arrest? Let's have a look points to prove book so <clears throat> we're looking at the police and criminal evidence act 1984 obviously and it says here section 32 a constable may search an arrested person in any case where the person to be searched has been arrested at a place other than a police station ding 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 if the constable has reasonable grounds for believing that the arrested person may present a danger to himself or others now we've just answered that haven't we by knowing that definition so a place other than a police station if we go back to the question it's saying that newman bless him has voluntarily took himself to the police station where you then arrested him that means you cannot search them under section 32 of pace so we know that question uh, one the answer is no but obviously we need to search people in custody and that's when we use section 54 of pace okay question two as i mentioned these are things you'll cover in your first couple of weeks in training so before you get your knowledge check you'll cover everything so make sure you actually pay attention in class take notes how it's best for you um yeah and make sure you, you are doing your homework as well so the uh, rpldp the public is a short course but it is intense and all you're going to be doing for the that 16 to 20 weeks is studying and being at the police place where you're training you'll have no time for fun sorry okay so you arrest Stanistree on suspicion of burglary and when administering the caution you say you don't have to say anything unless you want to but it may harm your defense if you do not mention when questioned something which you relate to in court anything you do say will be taken down and could be given in evidence hmm. sounds unusual doesn't it so, does this deviation from the correct caution render any replies made by Stanistry inadmissible? So, the answers are yes, the caution must always be word for word. No, the sense of the relevant caution is preserved. Yes, such errors would make any replies by Stanistry inadmissible. Oh no, provided that you give Stanistry proper legal advice prior to the interview. So, this question is asking you whether or not you know your caution. So you don't have to say anything, but it may harm your defence. If you do not mention when questioned something which you later on in court, anything you do so may be given in evidence. So let's have a look at this. You don't have to say anything unless you want to, but it may harm your defence if you don't mention when questioned something which you later on in court. Anything you do so will be taken down and could be given in evidence. So do we think the deviation from the correct caution 
renders any replies made by Stanley Street inadmissible. What do you think? Well, I can tell you the answer is no, because the sense of the relevant caution is preserved. So we're going, you don't have to say anything. We've got that bit. But it may harm your defence. We've got that bit. If you do not mention, we've got that. We've got don't mention. When questioned, yep. Something which later on in court, we've got that. And anything that you do say, we'll still like maybe, uh, maybe give an evidence. And they've said, will be taken down and could be given evidence. So the deviation, albeit it's not word for word, doesn't detract from the points that you've got to give in your caution. So the answer is, no, the sense of the relevant caution is preserved. Okay, that's question two. Question three. Now then, we are looking at um, arresting people, so you should know um, what you need to arrest people and why arrest is necessary. So this next question is looking at necessity criteria. Okay, so you should know these if you are past week one, two, three, or whatever it is in training when you start doing this. Okay, so you've arrested Seward for dropping litter as Seward has refused to give her name or address, naughty, naughty Seward. And we don't know them, they're not known to us. So we radio for a vehicle to take us to the police station. And when it arrives, um, the vehicle is driven by PC um, Mouse, <laughs> I was making it up. Uh, and Mouse recognises Seward and knows the address that she lives at. And PC Mouse informs you of these facts. So she's like, ugh, I know Seward. She lives at 123 West Street, um, S14WJ. Cool, thanks. So we've only arrested Seward for dropping litter. Do we need to take them into the police station? This is why he's asking us. So which of the following could be the cause of action? So we take Seward to the police station where the custody officer should release them in light of this new information, because so now we've got the name and address. So we de-arrest Seward, release her, make a note of the actions taken, and report her on summons for the offence of dropping litter. We take Seward to a police station, where the custody officer should charge her with the offence in view of the initial refusal to give details. Or D, de-arrest Seward, release her, make a note of the actions taken, and report her for summons, the offences of dropping litter and failing to give their details. And the correct answer here is to de-arrest them, uh, release them, make a note of the actions taken and report them for summons for the offence of dropping litter. There you go. So all it's asking is if you've still got the necessity criteria but you've got the name and address so you don't need to arrest them because all you'd, your necessity for arrest, for taking with a liberty, would be because you need to ascertain the you know, the name and address, the details, so you can report them on summons. But now you've got those details, you don't need to um, take them to custody for the custody officer to look at you like, why are you wasting my time? Um, you can do the report on summons and off you pop. So there you go. That's why that answer is like it is. Okay, I hope this is helping, guys. This is a really big one. This next question that I wrote comes up, I think, in every single knowledge check that I have had the pleasure of doing and marking this is always in there, okay? So, Leeson, aged 14 years, is in custody for the first time, having been arrested on suspicion of theft. His mother, as an appropriate adult, has arrived at the police station. What is the role of the appropriate adult in an interview? Now, for this question, we just ignore the top bit. Um, we know that the person's 14 and they've got an appropriate adult. So let's have a look at what is the role of an appropriate adult in an interview. Is it A, to only advise a detained person as to their rights? B, to simply act as an observer? C, to comfort the detained person should they become upset? Or D, to facilitate communication with the detained person? It's D, it's D, it's always facilitate communication. Remember that, to facilitate communication with the detained person. That's what your appropriate adult is there for. This question comes up in every single knowledge check that I've ever seen, and I'm not sure why. Um, but yeah, I'm guessing a lot of people must get it wrong, but that's what your appropriate adult is there for. Okay, and well, last one, I've only done five because I can't give the game away completely and I'll get fired. So, you have arrested uh, Hisane in the public area of the police station, inquiry office. <laughs> okay. So we've already done this. 
And this will happen in knowledge checks, okay? So you've arrested Hussaini in the public area of the police station inquiry office. To what extent, under section 32 of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984, can you search Hussaini in these circumstances? And here are the questions. You can request removal of the outer coat, jacket and gloves. You can request removal of any item of clothing out of public view. You have no power to search the circumstances given. You can request removal of garments only for a concealed weapon. What do we think that one might be? Oh, I'm going to get done for that. <laughs> it is, you have no power to search them under section 32. They are in a police station. So if we go back to the search, section 32 definition, uh, you can search people after arrest in any place other than a police station. Okay, so we know using that definition, you have no power to search them because you are in a police station. So you might think, all right, this, this, it might sound quite obvious when I'm sat going through with you, of course it does. But just think back to the definitions that you'll have covered in training. Make sure you do your homework and look out for those key points. So any place other than a police station. Okay, cool. Um, appropriate adult to facilitate communication necessity criteria all the things you will be covering in your first few weeks of training will be in your first knowledge check and they're not there to catch you out the knowledge checks are there to make sure that you're on the right track and if there's anything you need to cover again they know that they can cover it if uh, so what we used to have for example would we check all the different scores and if there's one particular question where everybody was getting it wrong we'd be like oh, that's that's an us problem that so we need to go back and re-deliver that because clearly they've not got it and for everyone to get it wrong that's definitely something on the training side that's not worked okay i made another bonus question because why not this one is all about your categories of offense because i get a lot of questions about that so strapping guys here we go there are three separate categories of offense one of the categories is offenses triable only on indictment Okay, how can indictable offences be distinguished from other categories of crime? A, these are offences that are serious but can be dealt with either at the Magistrates Court or the Crown Court. We're looking at indictable only. These are considered to be the most serious offences and can only be dealt with by the Crown Court. C, these are the least serious offences and can only be dealt with by the Magistrates Court. Or D, these involve domestic issues and must be dealt with at the county court. Okay, so let's go back to the question. We know that there are three separate categories of offence. And this one's asking us all about um, offences triable only on indictment. So we're looking at indictable only offences. So if you go back to your categories of offence, we know indictable only is your top one. We're looking at murders and kidnaps and all the big horrible things, rapes. So we know that's the most serious and can only be dealt with by the Crown Court. Now, sometimes when you're looking at legislation, it might say indictable or either way. So that's where people get a bit unstuck with stuff like this. And that means when you're looking either way, it depends. It can go to magistrates or Crown, depending on the severity of it. But we are looking at indictable only, which is what causes the confusion. Indictable only, indictable slash either way or summary only. We are indictable only. So make sure you get that terminology right. So there are a few questions that I've thrown together. I hope that they've helped and please do let me know if you'd like me to cover anything else in the videos. Thank you very much. Uh, in the meantime, stay safe, look after each other and please don't commit any crimes.